an insight into the legend never before seen by the public. Bert will be here in the Channel 9 studios. I'll be over there deep in the heart of Elvis country at 10.40 Monday night on 9. Anyway, uh, it'll be a great show tonight, too. Uh, around wearing jeans, blue suede shoes, <laughs> satin shirts. I think he's really been affected by the whole thing. I said to him on the phone today, how's the weather going in Memphis? And he said, well, the weather's very cloudy, and I think it's going to rain. Forecast for tomorrow. I hung up on him. I'm not going to listen to him. <laughs> and you're also going to hear some thought-provoking statements about Elvis from his two close friends and bodyguards, Rhett and Sonny West. It's an interview we did a while back. We're going to play some excerpts from that. And uh, we thought we'd just chat with him quickly on the phone to see uh, what's going on over there and uh, what I'm going to run into when I do go there, which I'm, I'm leaving in the morning, actually, for the United States. So uh, they tell me he's on here. Hello? Hello, Don. How are you? Uh, uh, I'm well, Kevin. First of all, how's the weather in Memphis? <laughs> uh, it's about 84 degrees Ooh. by Fahrenheit here. Yeah? It's, it's very, very humid at the moment. Uh, all right. And what about the preparations, Kevin? Now, I, you know, I've only been on the other end of the phone, and I haven't really talked much about it. What's, what's going into this thing? Well, the most incredible thing, I think, is the technical side so far. We're, what we're dealing with is 21st century technology, and the Americans we've dealt with so far are absolutely amazed at what we're doing. I don't think anyone in the world before has had a two-way satellite program, which is really going halfway around the world, to our live television program. It's never happened before. I think we better explain to people first, usually, uh, in case you're not aware of it, when we do the satellite interviews overseas, they usually can't see us. We can see them, but they can't see us. It's only booked one way. This satellite because um, we're having the show in the studio as well in, as in Memphis, has to be booked both ways. So you can imagine, it takes, I think, is that twice as much equipment, Kevin? Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, we've got two aspects here. We've, got, we've had to build a 100-foot transmission tower at the back of Graceland, outside the Graceland kitchen. And the terrifying thing now is if a tornado comes, the kitchen's going to be destroyed by the... Hang, 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 hang. <laughs> what tornado? I say, if a tornado happens to come... Oh, I thought... <laughs> you sound like you're sitting there waiting for Tornado Freddy or something to come through. Huh? No, we haven't forecast one yet. Ah, right, yeah. And the other thing is that there's a backup system, a satellite ground control station on a 14-ton truck is on its way from Miami here to Memphis, which is a distance of about 1,400 miles. That should get here any day now. They set out a couple of days ago. Wow. What's going to happen is the signal will come from the ground at Gracelands up to a domestic American satellite above America. The signal is then beamed down from the satellite to San Francisco. <laughs> Francisco picks up the program. They send it up to the Pacific satellite. The Pacific satellite sends it down to Sydney, <laughs> sent to Melbourne. See, why pay all that money for world tours? All you have to do is watch us and you stop everywhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> what about what about the Graceland itself, uh, Kevin? Uh, what's the, what's the feeling like inside the place? Well, Don, we went there for the first time six days ago, last Saturday, actually. And when you walk into that house, nothing has been changed at all. The same staff are there. You've got the same cooking smells, the same furniture that Elvis sat in. Nothing about that house has been changed so far. And when you walk into that house and you stand in the hallway behind the front door, you wouldn't be surprised if any second Elvis opened up that door and came in from, the, you know, from a tour or from, from a trip around Memphis. The atmosphere there, you would almost cut with a knife. And I'm waiting for you to get to that house so I can watch the expression on your face. I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a bit sensitive to these sorts of things, but I think you're more sensitive than I am. And you could really cut that atmosphere in great Thanks. with a knife. It's as if Elvis is still there. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. So already I'm talking to it 12,000 miles away. I get a woo! Do you feel do you feel strong vibrations in the house? Yes, you do, Don, certainly, because as I say, if nothing has been changed, I mean you can you can expect Elvis to come down to the billiard room any minute and shoot pool. Right. Uh, <laughs> so that just opposite that room is a television room where he used to sit there and watch television with his friends. You get to see any of uh, any of his stuff. There's a trophy room we're gonna go into there, isn't there? Oh yes, that's incredible. I've been literally down on hands and knees going through all the boxes of gold records. I've never seen so much gold in all my life. <laughs> And I've been going through several uh, private things of Elvis that are down there at the moment. All his private photographic albums with photographs of his friends, his relations, his uncles, his cousins. He was very much a family man, as you know. Yeah. And this stayed with him all the time. Uh, I found a letter from President Nixon, for example. 
You got, oh, you mean a, a letter to Elvis from President Nixon? Yeah, but oh. so apparently it rang President Nixon when Nixon was in the hospital. There was a letter of appreciation from the president. Mm. Uh, there's a letter from the vice president of the Ford Company congratulating Elvis on buying a 1962 Thunderbird. Oh, <laughs> yes. Well, all right, well, I'll get to see all of that stuff with you when we get there. Uh, and, uh, and take it easy. I, they, they tell me you're working hard, kid. We start at 8 o'clock in the morning, and so far the earliest we finish is 2 o'clock the next morning. You know what oh. Feynman is like. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I do know, too. Give Peter Feynman my best. Tell him I'll see you soon, and I'll see you too soon. Uh, I'll see you too <laughs> soon. I certainly will, and I'll soon soon see you in Memphis, 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 Memphis. Okay? See you, Kevin. Um, uh, you'll really have to tax your memory for this one. Uh, a few years ago, we managed to obtain an exclusive interview with Red and Sonny West. Now, before I start getting Elvis fans up there, uh, Elvis fans are really fanatical, you know? They, they jump up and down a lot and they scream the minute you mention Red and Sonny West. Uh, they were the brothers who were friends with Elvis from his teens, and they remained with him for years as his bodyguards. Um, they were with Elvis through practically all his waking hours, and they were the nucleus of what became the Memphis Mafia. And when they parted from Elvis, they, along with Australian journalist Steve Dunleavy, had a book published that revealed a lot of startling facts about the king. Now, Elvis's fans uh, scream bloody murder because uh, they feel that he was betrayed by Red and Sonny West. Well, that may be the case. Uh, maybe they did. They never really tried to cash in uh, on the book. Uh, when they were asked why they did such a book, they gave us their reason that they always maintained the hope that Elvis would read it and realize what he was doing to himself. Now, the eventual uh, outcome of uh, Elvis's life, or the demise of Elvis, of course, was um, as a direct result of what those boys wrote about. So, obviously, they weren't lying. The book came out before Elvis died, as you may know. So on the road in Las Vegas, or secure at home behind the walls of the expanse of Graceland, where we're going to go, Red and Sonny West were his personal bodyguards. But what kind of a job is that, and what was that like? How dangerous is a job being a bodyguard for someone like an Elvis Presley? It, could, it can get very dangerous. You know, no, uh, even uh, with people who are not trying to hurt him, you can get hurt pretty bad. Have there ever been any like, cl close calls? No, I don't think so. Do you, so well, not really, Harry. Not, not except for unless you call the threat yeah, uh, of, of something that was supposed to happen being a very close call. Enough so that the FBI was brought in on it because it was shortly after the Manson killings uh, in 69 here and Elvis received a death threat and a menu with his face uh, from the main showroom arrived the next day after the FBI had called in just for the call and had his face all scribbled out and it had a gun drawn next to it pointing to his heart and it said at the bottom it said guess from whom and when written backwards and uh, this this was one of those factors that contributed to his withdrawing more uh, Don and taking drugs because this frightened him so much uh, he became aware after the Sharon Tate thing if there were people out there that would kill you for no reason at all and kill many of you and this started driving him more and more into himself. And then, of course, his marriage breakup uh, also contributed. And you take all of these things, plus how when he was on stage, he felt that he wasn't allowed to, to take uh, his personal problems on stage and perform. He felt that these people should have the best that he could possibly do. And he would take these things that would give him a false energy level, which uh, I, we know because we took them. It makes you feel, uh, it makes you forget about your own personal problems and just doing what you're doing. You're so locked into what you're doing. And he had to get this energy level because it wasn't there anymore. You go, wait a minute, fellas. Wasn't there a time when uh, he was on stage and uh, to show the dedication of you two, uh, you were prepared to throw yourself in front of him in case someone did fire a, uh, a weapon? Well, we, we did that once in Las Vegas. After this first death threat, then you got all the the Goonie birds coming out of the wall, they're all doing this. And we, we noticed the, uh, the waiters, the head waiters, the lights went up in the showroom and the head waiters were all in the audience looking around. And they called backstage and told Joe Esposito that the, as some lady supposedly in, 
the front row with a gun and she's gonna, you know, shoot Elvis. Yeah. So naturally you, you gotta take this serious. Mm. So before, on the last song, well, Elvis went into, the, uh, Joe motioned for him to come into the wings and told him, so Elvis stayed back away from the front of the stage. He wasn't in the show. He said, no, I'm, you know, I'll do the show. But he stood sideways and tried to make a small target. And just before the curtain come, uh, came down on the last song, Sonny and I both walked out right on stage and stood in front of him. And I, I had to tell you, mm. I was a little scared. I, would, <laughs> I wouldn't blame you. Is it true that he, he carried a gun in, uh, in his boots when he worked? <laughs> yeah, he, he had a Derringer. <clears throat> he had a Derringer that he, that he carried uh, always. This man would come out of his, he would come out of his bedroom in the suite up there at the Hilton with no one around but us. And he would come around with his gun either tucked in his pajamas or, or his robe belt. <laughs> and when he would sit down to eat breakfast, he'd put that gun right there beside him. And that's several times when he shot the TV set out is when he'd just reach over and get it, cock it, shoot it, <laughs> put it down, finish eating. Because he knew when he left the room an hour later, there'd be another TV set in there. I mean, he was one of the guys that could afford to have it done. And, he wouldn't have to say, I want another TV set here. He knew that it would be there if he just gave us about an hour to get one up there. He, he, he had this thing against Robert Goulet, I remember reading in the book. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm smiling, yeah. <laughs> Robert Goulet was on TV at the wrong time, <laughs> and Ellis was having breakfast, and uh, it was too far to walk and turn it off, so he, <laughs> he turned it off from the table. You mean he shot him? Right. Through, the, through his own television set. <laughs> <laughs>